Uh, welcome uh, to the uh, fifth uh, keynote speech of ICIV and IBPR uh, conference uh, lecture series. So today we have a very uh, wonderful speaker and highly distinguished person uh, with us. Uh, he's uh, uh, Professor James Conrad uh, from University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And he's the current IEEE USA president. So it, it is our great, great privilege to have him and we sincerely thank him that he accepted uh, to give us time. And um, uh, the, it's very early morning for him, definitely. <laughs> so um, uh, he told me that uh, it's 7 a.m. So because of this, because in our announcement, we put it 8 a.m. Uh, his time or uh, Eastern time. So uh, I think that some of the participants were, will be delayed, but no problem, we'll have recorded version in YouTube and we can uh, enjoy it anytime uh, we'd like to uh, enjoy. So with that, I I mean, big people, we don't need to introduce too much. So I'd like to request uh, Professor James Conrad uh, to start his uh, wonderful speech. And it's a very uh, important one. And I hope that I, I enjoyed his talk, uh, I mean, uh, just, uh, uh, I mean, few several weeks ago, and then I found it wonderful. So that's why I requested him and we are very glad to have him. So Professor James, please start. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much and uh, welcome all of you for uh, attending this. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about is a way for uh, uh, professionals and students to get involved in a very, uh, unfortunately, recently a very frequent uh, activity and that is disaster relief. Uh, I'm going to talk about our, uh, what we call the MOVE Community Outreach Project, which uh, its centerpiece is a very large uh, truck that has a lot of communications equipment and technology inside of it. Uh, and it's the perfect way for uh, an electrical and computer engineer or somebody in the computer sciences field to get involved with uh, serving your local community. So the, uh, the one thing to uh, mention, why should you be watching uh, this webinar? And that is that we're going to discuss the steps that we completed to create this IEEE MOVE disaster response vehicle. Um, if you see right here in the little picture, that's a little toy that somebody did for us that uh, has some, uh, has some actually uh, pretty appropriate uh, equipment on top that we uh, use for our vehicle. Um, and this, uh, this is a great way to engage IEEE members and sections, chapters, regions. Um, so what you're going to see in this presentation is mostly a IEEE centric uh, presentation. Uh, I should mention that uh, I, uh, India has expressed an interest of wanting a solution too. It may not be quite the same as a very large uh, uh, mobile vehicle. Um, it may be a smaller solution. But I'm happy to announce two things. First of all, that the, the uh, IEEE has decided to fund an international uh, version of the MOVE project uh, that has just been uh, officially approved two weeks ago. Uh, they got uh, $150,000, I believe, 150 US dollars, uh, to be able to start to do the, the work associated with this. Um, that doesn't buy the equipment, but that actually uh, allows us to start uh, the organization. And so our first two test areas is going to be India, as well as uh, the Caribbean. And uh, I'm also happy to announce, I don't know if uh, many of you out there are IEEE members, uh, student members, but uh, IEEE has just uh, approved uh, half cost membership. So if you are not an IEEE member yet, uh, soon you will find out how you can join for half the usual price. And if you have already renewed your membership, uh, you will find out soon as to how you can um, extend that membership into a second year uh, and you have already paid for the first year. So uh, if you are not yet a uh, IEEE member, uh, soon you will be afforded the opportunity to enter in a specific uh, code and be able to get uh, half price dues. So 
going back onto the uh, subject, what is this IEEE MOVE vehicle? Well, it is disaster relief, public visibility, but we also use it for uh, outreach to school children and the general public on science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. And in particular, uh, if we look at uh, what are the uh, capabilities of this vehicle, uh, it is mobile transportation. So we are able to uh, ship or carry with us a lot of uh, equipment. Uh, we have a lot of equipment on board that handles uh, communications of all sorts, uh, many types of radios, as well as data communications. It is office space. So here you see there are chairs and tables uh, that we could use for uh, office type work. And this vehicle does generate its own power. And so uh, we have a vehicle that uh, can supply uh, some power to the outside world, but it will also power everything inside itself. So in a nutshell, this is a saying in the US, what, in other words, uh, a quick one slide, what is this and what is it not? Well, our, uh, our vehicle or our project in general is for disaster survivors uh, who have survived the initial catastrophe and they're feeling that they're uh, disconnected with the outside world. Uh, if you can imagine, um, I know a lot of uh, students nowadays have mobile phones and uh, that's the way they connect with each other. Now imagine that you don't have power to charge that mobile phone. And now that mobile phone becomes pretty much worthless after about two days, three days when the power runs out. And so our objective was to be able to provide communications like power support and, uh, and informational support to uh, victims as well as for volunteers who are helping those victims. Now we're uh, uh, intended to help disaster volunteers and survivors by supplying these services until the normal infrastructure is restored. And uh, um, initially we identified it uh, to be manned by the IEEE volunteer base and we've been able to do that over the years. So, our specific goals, as we mentioned uh, earlier, provide communications, energy, light, and information to disaster survivors. And the, uh, the comfort to survivors uh, includes, if you could imagine this, the ability to communicate with loved ones outside of the affected area. Uh, and once we uh, look at what we do for uh, disaster survivors, there is also when we're not in a uh, disaster situation, what can we use the truck for? And that is also uh, for educational outreach to STEM students and, and the general public. So for example, we have been to uh, uh, different festivals uh, and have demonstrated the technology of our vehicle. And we actually do a very good job of engaging members through this uh, vehicle because the vehicle needs a lot of support, things like uh, uh, just recently it needed to be washed. Um, and we had a couple of vehicles or a couple of volunteers do that. Uh, we're creating a ham radio club uh, and we have a lot of uh, IEEE members involved in that. Uh, we installed new radio equipment and we had some more volunteers do that. And then finally, we actually go to deployments and we need volunteers uh, to do that. So this all became uh, or came to fruition because of a hurricane that impacted the Eastern United States by the name of Superstorm Sandy. It was uh, both a hurricane and uh, an additional, I, I believe the correct word for it is called a nor'easter. And uh, the problem with that is uh, the, the storm and its aftermath were uh, lasting from 10 to 12 days and there was absolutely no power restored. So if you can imagine for an area that is used to having um, uh, power and using that power for heat as well as communications, 
and uh, people had no uh, no power at all for 12 days or more. Uh, things got at night pretty darn dark. And uh, of course, they had no knowledge of what services were available because they had no communications equipment that was operational because they had no power. Uh, and it was rather unnerving for them. And by the way, I should mention the uh, most impacted area was the headquarters of IEEE. And so we had a lot of um, IEEE staff members who had uh, who were experiencing all of this. Well, this I idea came out of uh, the state of North Carolina, which is where uh, a lot of hurricanes hit. And some of our volunteers uh, started to do some uh, assessment of what the similar vehicles are that uh, could do this. Uh, FEMA, which is the uh, Federal Emergency Management Authority uh, of the U.S. government, uh, has vehicles that uh, do this, but very often they concentrate on first responders. Uh, there's a company called Cisco. Uh, they, uh, they make routers. I'm, I'm sure all of you are aware of Cisco. They actually have a, uh, a couple of vehicles, uh, some on the East Coast and some on the West Coast. But they really concentrate on uh, first responders. First responders uh, would be fire, police, and uh, uh, army, and, and other uh, professionals uh, that are paid by the government to you know, keep order or, or provide services. And then there is the uh, amateur radio services, emergency services uh, group, and they uh, handle communications, but they don't really have power. And so we started creating at the beginning of our project uh, some requirements. And if you are a good engineer, you should know that you always start with requirements when you are uh, when you're creating your project, so that uh, when you actually go and implement it, you can identify did we uh, did we meet the uh, did we meet the requirements or did we do everything we said we would do? And so. One of our requirements was that we would have cellular charging. And in the end, we identified that we would not necessarily have uh, cellular phones for this charging, but instead we would have uh, one of those uh, charging devices. And uh, those devices look very much like uh, this one I'm showing in my, uh, um, in my camera, where uh, you can charge it up via a USB uh, cord, and it also uh, provides uh, a chance for you to plug in a, uh, a charger uh, cable, but uh, probably more importantly, and I'm trying to figure out of where the button is. I, it's been a while. There we go. Well, I'm not going to be able to, to figure this out in, uh, in the short amount of time that I have, uh, but uh, there is, a, um, uh, there is a, a light on this as well that is uh, useful for, um, uh, for the uh, victims to actually have uh, light while they are in, their, uh, in the midst of their disaster. We also wanted, uh, for one of our requirements, uh, the ability to communicate information and either display it on monitors or print it out for people, as well as display weather, uh, news, and other status, and to actually uh, be a hotspot for internet access. So with all that in mind, you need to, uh, of course, make sure that you can connect to the internet from this vehicle. Uh, the other uh, set of requirements of things that we wanted to make sure that we had is uh, an onboard generator, as well as solar panels, as well as all the uh, appropriate hardware to be able to convert uh, the solar panel energy into uh, energy usable by our, our truck and equipment, as well as internet access that we wanted to have this vehicle operate on its own power, recharge these battery packs that I uh, displayed, and then be able to display television stations. But there are some things we decided we did not want to have, 
which makes uh, my daughter very sad. And that is uh, the vehicle would not include uh, bathroom facilities because then you have to clean up after that, um, which includes water and sewer. Uh, the vehicle would not have amateur radio capability. And that was initially, and now we have decided that we're gonna put it in the truck. In the United States, there is a regulation that if your vehicle is over uh, 26,000 pounds, uh, please do the calculation of kilograms on your own. But if the vehicle is bigger than that, then you need a commercial driver's license. That's what a CDL means. So we wanted to have it such that uh, anybody who was not a truck driver could actually drive this uh, vehicle. And so what we now do is IEEE, uh, our, or our group will provide training on how the equipment and the truck works. Uh, we ask our volunteers in our IEEE volunteers to also take Red Cross courses uh, that way that they are able to um, uh, talk the lingo of Red Cross and they're all by the way Red Cross if you're not familiar is a, uh, uh, a worldwide organization for um, for the aid in case of uh, disasters they also uh, uh, collect blood and, and redistribute that blood. And uh, they're known all throughout the world, Red Cross as well as Red Crescent. And then also um, because these uh, IEEE volunteers are also Red Cross volunteers, uh, they're able to be served as uh, Red Cross volunteers in disasters, which means that while they're deploying with our IEEE truck, uh, the Red Cross will take care of their, their uh, needs like sleeping needs as well as uh, uh, sanitation and food. We also ask our volunteers to take the US Federal Emergency Management Authority uh, courses so that they understand uh, how one really uh, uh, reacts or, or uh, works in a disaster environment. And then we have other volunteers that may have other training needs like STEM and public visibility uh, training. I mentioned before that we also do STEM outreach and so I uh, thought I'd point out that uh, we have many opportunities uh, to have kids like this uh, girl on the left-hand side to uh, figure out how to make circuits. In fact, she's got a special pen that actually puts down a conductive, uh, a, a conductive wire on a piece of paper. So she's in the process right there of making an electrical circuit that has a battery and an LED and a switch involved. And uh, I personally uh, have taken a couple of these pictures. Uh, we actually go to, uh, for example, science festivals like the like the Atlanta, Georgia Science Festival, as well as the uh, Boy Scout Jamboree. And uh, we display our, uh, our technology and talk about how disaster relief can uh, come about. We partner very closely with the American Red Cross right now, and we're gonna expand that into, uh, into the International Red Cross. And we go to a disaster based on the American Red Cross request. And we uh, ensure that we are uh, able to uh, be accommodated at an American Red Cross emergency shelter because as I mentioned, uh, we need that sleeping facilities and, and food and sanitation uh, capabilities since our truck doesn't have that. So, what we uh, provide to the American Red Cross is internet access via our Wi-Fi. We also uh, distribute uh, these power banks that I showed you and information. And, uh, and down below, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we do depend on the American Red Cross for shelter, food, sanitation, and the possibility of needing diesel fuel. So our uh, onboard generator actually uh, consumes approximately four days for our uh, 
for our vehicle to run at uh, full bore providing uh, power. And we, uh, we are able to get uh, diesel fuel to uh, provide us that uh, um, energy needed to, of course, run the generators. So then when we uh, first deployed to our disasters in the year, I believe it was uh, 2016, uh, we had uh, several, in fact, that year we had, I'm, I'm sorry, in, uh, in some of our disaster uh, deployments, I believe this is for the year 2018, um, we realized that we needed several people to be present for uh, some of these deployments because uh, we were finding that uh, there was a lot of need and we were doing a lot of work. Now, not only does, uh, not only do IEEE volunteers uh, volunteer and work in the truck using uh, the equipment, but they also help the American Red Cross set up their uh, division headquarters. And they find that IEEE members are very good problem solvers, uh, which means that they don't get apparently a lot of engineers to help them out with their uh, disaster deployments. Uh, we are a very good uh, base of knowledge for uh, technology in general, and we're finding more and more that there is a lot of technology needed uh, for disaster relief. We do have uh, networking capability, uh, as well as uh, internet protocol, IP phones, uh, which run through our satellite communications. And I'll talk about the uh, technology in just a minute. So here are some pictures of uh, disaster uh, deployments. Uh, we have in the center, uh, there were wildfires that were uh, happening in the mountains of Tennessee. And uh, that would be a location of uh, several cars and the associated houses that were there. Uh, you, you don't really see anything left of the houses. Uh, that would be very similar to what happened to a lot of places. On the right-hand side uh, is that situation where I said we can actually haul a lot of equipment. Uh, each one of those boxes carries um, sets of laptops, uh, satellite dish printers, and other uh, equipment that Red Cross may need. And we had, in this case, uh, transported from uh, one location to another. And uh, I think all of you are familiar with uh, the company Budweiser, correct? And so uh, for natural disasters, um, Budweiser switches from uh, putting beer in cans to putting water in cans and makes that available to uh, disaster victims as well as uh, vol uh, volunteers helping out. Uh, some more examples of uh, some of our deployments and activities that we uh, were doing. So let's talk about this move vehicle. And so uh, to be uh, uh, accurate, let's start with the vehicle itself. And we have what is considered a freight liner. That's a manufacturer uh, chassis with a custom box on the back. And that's where we put all of our uh, all of our communications equipment, and it has a Cummins diesel engine. So this would be very similar to many of the vehicles that you may see driving around in India. Um, I should mention that I've actually been to India uh, anywhere between six and seven times. I can't remember exactly how many. So I've seen plenty of trucks driving around. This might be a little bit bigger than many of the trucks. It is not though an 18 wheeler. If you look at the top of our vehicle, this is some of the uh, really important uh, equipment that we have. Uh, of course, solar panels, and uh, the closer to the bottom, that big giant internet satellite dish. But we also have a broadcast TV antenna, that's the roundish thing, and more importantly, air conditioners, because very often when we're deploying, it's relatively hot, and uh, with all the communications equipment running inside, we need to make it cool, but we also need to make the, uh, um, the volunteers cool. So let's talk about uh, office space. As I mentioned, we have uh, 
lots of chairs, and uh, we have a couple tables that are uh, naturally built into this vehicle. And so very often we have a need for uh, uh, using these tables uh, for laptops and equipment that, uh, and the work that we may need to do. We have found, however, that uh, we need even more table space. And so uh, here is, uh, uh, here's another space that we can actually uh, uh, bring in more tables and more chairs. And in fact, uh, we are now, uh, now that the hurricane season is over, we're going to have uh, where you see this uh, temporary table sitting right there with that laptop. We're actually gonna have a, uh, a permanent table installed there that we'll be able to flip up if we need to. And this just gives you an idea of uh, more of what some of the uh, inside of the truck looks like. You can see that there is a, uh, a TV over here on the left-hand side. And there's what we call a pass-through from this, uh, this large office space area to the truck cab, which is uh, towards the front through that little hole that you see right up there. So there are two seats up there uh, for the truck. And uh, in, in the United States, there are laws that uh, every passenger in a vehicle must be uh, wearing a seat belt. And so uh, we have to ensure that all of these uh, seats in our vehicle have seat belts. There is plenty of space in the back and uh, example of how we put lots of equipment back there. However, we do now have a new change and that is we're finding more and more that it is uh, because of COVID, um, the environment for large areas where many, many, many people sleep are not, uh, are not done anymore. So we are actually putting two sleeping berths or bunks inside of our vehicle. And you can see over here where those, uh, where those yellow topped uh, containers are, we're actually gonna be putting our sleeping berths back there. And uh, so getting back into the technical aspect, we do have a, uh, a Cummins 10 kilowatt commercial diesel generator. It is generating 240 volts at uh, 60 Hertz, because that is the, uh, uh, that is the technology in the United States. Uh, we, most of our equipment in the vehicle operates at 120 volts, 60 Hertz. And so uh, after our generator creates the, uh, the power needed, we actually uh, do step it down. We do also have a opportunity We also have uh, an interesting power distribution model, which I'll show in a few minutes, that allows us to um, draw energy from batteries and the batteries are charged by solar. Uh, we have a full set of electrical breakers as well as equipment on board uh, that uses uh, the 240 volts. For example, our air conditioner uses the 240 volts. Um, we have lights that run at both 120 volts and at 12 volts. Our uh, in fact, here, I'll show this on this next picture right here. We have uh, three solar panels and a solar panel charge controller, which is uh, um, charging up some 12 volt batteries in the truck. The 12 volt batteries itself um, is used for uh, outlets inside the vehicle. It, uh, it can be used to uh, take power from our generator or take power from our batteries and, and run our communications equipment. We also have 12 volt LED lights inside the vehicle. So if we want to run our uh, vehicle from LED lights instead of fluorescent lights, we can do that. And as you see on the left-hand side, uh, we can hook up either uh, shore power 
or uh, use our Cummins generator, which uh, runs on diesel energy, and uh, uh, run that through our inverter as well to provide power for the entire vehicle, as well as charge our batteries. And our batteries are pretty big. I'm not sure I have a picture of them in, in this presentation. So we have communications, and key to that is a satellite system where we have a a self-moving uh, satellite dish that will actually uh, deploy on top of the vehicle. It will unfold and it will look for the closest communication satellite and uh, it will rotate until it gets the, uh, the best gain for communications uh, between the satellite and us at being a base station. And so from that uh, satellite uh, upload, download, uh, the data that we have will run our IP phones as well as uh, ethernet that we uh, run in the vehicle itself. And then we also have uh, additional uh, TV downlinks for looking at the weather channel and CNN. As well as I should say, we could also uh, turn on the sports channel and watch our, our favorite uh, uh, football game or our favorite uh, cricket game uh, if we need to. All right, I'm just joking. We don't watch the cricket games. The other communications capabilities that we've added uh, since we first uh, started our vehicle is weather service radio, uh, LTE, which is a uh, um, one of the data communications uh, protocols for cellular phones. We've added CB radio. Uh, that's called citizen band radio. We have short range walkie talkies. We also have public service scanners. In other words, we can monitor the police and fire department frequencies. Ham radio is, is also known as um, uh, amateur radio. And then in the United States, we have uh, FirstNet, which is an emergency responder cell phone network that only first responders, uh, police, fire, uh, military have access to. <clears throat> if you notice, we have uh, two 19-inch racks. These are standard communications like racks. And one of them is uh, dedicated solely to communications. And the other is for our charging stations. And uh, it allows us to uh, have lots of cabling, but also we have the capability of running some of our cabling out the side of the truck and perhaps to be uh, run to the interior of a building. And in fact, we have done that this year alone. Um, we visited facilities that did not have power or communications. And so we ran a couple of extension cords out to their building as well as some uh, communications cables. I already talked about the uh, the power bank, and it uh, has a capability of storing 8,000 milliamp hours of energy. Uh, it is a five volt device, so you're able to charge your mobile phones or other type of mobile device. And it also allows you to uh, turn on a light. And uh, before before we end up here, I'm going to figure out how to <clears throat> how to turn on my light. Ah, there we go. Here's my light. I just had to flick it on a couple of times. And uh, we found that uh, we can charge 120 of these. And uh, very often we have, uh, <clears throat> we have been able to distribute these to uh, Red Cross volunteers and and they return them back and we recharge them as well. We put them in racks like this and while we are running our generator on board, uh, we use that energy with some uh, six cable USB chargers. We put two of those uh, six cable USB chargers inside and we're able to for each one of these racks to charge up 12, um, 12 of these uh, battery packs and and we have 10 of these drawers. Now, 
there's only one of these vehicles. It costs $250,000 in U.S. money to, uh, uh, to build this. So it is expensive to build and deploy, and it can't go everywhere. So what we are starting to look at is how do we shrink this? You know, these racks of communications equipment, the generator, solar, down to something smaller. And so uh, I've worked on a project which is called Modular Move. It has the benefit of uh, being able to be deployed all over the world because it can be, um, it could be created and, and configured to handle the particular power that is in a particular region as well as their capabilities. You know, a good example would be perhaps a diesel generator is uh, better to be deployed in India for a, a small diesel generator in India versus a gasoline generator. In the US, uh, Honda sells a small generator that is about this big, uh, this big, I'm holding my hand out, that looks to be about uh, 50 centimeters uh, by 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters. And so we are looking at the, the capability of, of communications and power that could be uh, uh, replicated in Africa, in India, in, uh, in Europe, in South America, all over the place. And so originally the design was several boxes and you would pick and choose what you wanted. But we, through customer interviews, uh, found out that they really wanted a single box approach. And uh, we're still looking at power generation as well as power storage, uh, device charging, so still charging up some of these devices, as well as getting uh, data communications from some sort of wireless network, either, uh, either the cell phone network or data communications. And so we created a, a functional and rugged box um, that uh, what we put inside the box will do voltage conversion uh, as well as uh, wireless networking, internet, phone, and power bank charging. And here's an example of one that we have built. So in the top is our power bank charger tray. Uh, this allows us to charge as well 12 of these, uh, of these battery charger devices. In the uh, next tray, we can store even more of these uh, battery devices as well as cords and wires. Uh, in the box below that is where we have the cellular communications device along with Wi-Fi. And so uh, uh, it has the antennas and, and, the, and this is how we store it uh, when we transport them. It has all of the uh, equipment allowing us to uh, take cellular communications, and this assumes that we have cellular communications available, and then um, be able to uh, transmit via Wi-Fi uh, the capability uh, for you to hook up with the data. And then all the way at the bottom is a lithium-based uh, uninterruptible power supply and converter because we also have solar panels. And so we've put solar panels in this box and uh, what you see there is, is the half size of it, and it's in a container. So you can unfold the uh, solar panels and plug it into the converter. And not shown is going to be a diesel generator because you can um, use that diesel generator to, <clears throat> excuse me, you could use that diesel generator to uh, uh, charge up this uh, interruptible power supply because it's just a big giant battery and also to run your equipment. So in the future, uh, our IEEE MOVE project, or I should say our IEEE project is, uh, has been highly visible and uh, uh, most of the leadership of IEEE is aware of it and aware of its capabilities and, and firmly believe that it is uh, uh, something that could be deployed worldwide. And so right now we're working on an international focus uh, group study and, and now we're going to actually start the deployment of this so that we could have this modular move, a shipping container, 
or or maybe some smaller vehicle that could be uh, deployed all throughout the world and will take on the characteristics of that part of the world. So that is what I have. This is me. Uh, this is my first trip to India. I was, uh, uh, this guy wanted to visit me uh, as I was in Chennai going to the, um, I believe it was called the, the stone, uh, stone sculptures, uh, stone temples. And it uh, is a, during one of my trips, I was able to actually do some tourist type stuff. That is my contact information, although uh, the best way to reach me is via email. And if you want to know more information about the MOVE project, you can go here to uh, move.ieeeusa.org. And I'll uh, let you look at that before I go back to my other slide. And I see we had a, a question come in, so I will, uh, I will go to the chat. So if you have any uh, questions and comments, uh, please let me know, unmute, and I'll answer them. Yeah, James, uh, James uh, thank you so much uh, for your uh, wonderful presentation and uh, intermittent jokes about cricket versus soccer and so on. Yeah, uh, if you find that, I mean, the volunteers in the car is uh, from India or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or this region, uh, they will definitely fight to watch uh, cricket. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, thank you so much. So this is very, very interesting work indeed. And uh, if we can move further, it can be hugely, uh, I mean, uh, impactful in the community. So any questions or comments uh, from the participants? So we have uh, participants from different countries uh, as well, uh, even though the number is less, but, uh, mm, and it's on the Facebook live uh, continuing. So any questions or comments? Okay, uh, while somebody will ask some comments, I have uh, a couple of questions. Number one, uh, those who are late just to mention that move means mobile vehicle. So uh, the number one question is that, I mean, definitely uh, no electricity for 10, 12 days uh, is uh, very alarming, especially during disasters and especially in developed parts of the world because developing countries without electricity, uh, people are more or less used to in remote areas or islands and so on. So can you add more challenging issues that engineering students can try to deal uh, mm, uh, to uh, I mean, make this project number one cheaper, as well as I mean, uh, uh, we have more dissemination to the community. What are the challenging areas to do research in this uh, project? You think? Thank you. Well, you know, some of it is is obviously going to be done by uh, organizations that. Um, organizations that have a lot more resources than, than even IEEE. So a good example is uh, communications. The ideal communications would be uh, very inexpensive satellite communications. And right now there is uh, an effort by a couple of companies to put a blanket of low earth orbit satellites uh, around the world, around the earth, uh, that will allow us with uh, smaller antennas and uh, uh, less power to be able to do download and upload of data. And uh, many of the satellites, I, I think, uh, um, and, and I almost hate to say that uh, uh, this is Tesla, but uh, it is some organization, I can't remember exactly who it is, that uh, they have put a, a lot of SpaceX, you know, with SpaceX help, they have put a lot of, um, uh, lot of the satellites up around the Earth already, and they're about ready to deploy this entire uh, network next year is, uh, is the word I have. And so the, the way to make it less expensive is to have a cheaper way for communications. And, uh, and that means that uh, instead of that big, huge satellite dish that you saw on top of the vehicle, uh, we can have a smaller uh, pizza box style antenna, which would fit into our modular move box. And so uh, what students themselves can do, and, uh, and this is 
this is something that uh, I'm going to guess at because I, I don't know how it works in the rest of the world, but uh, I've told our students to become a Red Cross volunteer, which means uh, uh, they are a resource for natural disasters that may actually occur in their own area. They wouldn't have to go very far to be able to uh, be a Red Cross volunteer. Now, Red Cross has people that, uh, that uh, cook food. They have people who set up shelters. They have people that work one-on-one -on -one with uh, the victims who are affected. But the Red Cross also has a need for technology because uh, a lot of the work nowadays, it's all done with uh, computers and, uh, and internet. And so being Red Cross volunteered uh, being a Red Cross volunteer and helping out in the technology area uh, is one way to uh, stay in your uh, stay in your area of expertise, that being technology, communications, power, and then be able to be useful for those that are affected by a natural disaster. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We so, have a yeah, please. We have a question as yes, well. Yes, yes. So from Gazi, have you had any experience? Mm -hmm. All right. Have you had any experience in assisting in a non-trivial disaster with these tools? And um, one thing I should, uh, you know, mention as well is is that we are not necessarily a first responder, so we're not the first people to a disaster. Although in some cases we have been, and in fact we have been, and because we have power and we have communications, we have first responders come to us to make the call out for additional resources. Um, but uh, I personally have been on one of these deployments where uh, we have provided uh, technical equipment and technical capabilities for, uh, for shelters that had hundreds of people in that had actually no communications with the outside world. Uh, they did have power, but uh, they had no way to communicate to loved ones and so we were using uh, our, <clears throat> our internet uh, protocol, our IP phones, and uh, our internet for them to be able to send email messages and, and make phone calls. Uh, so we have done that as well. All right, so um, the next question, uh, are there any risk pro uh, projection regarding the nature of disaster to assist in? Uh, medical facilities, logical, customizable to, to that end. And so um, we usually deploy to, or at the request of Red Cross, and then Red Cross actually says, you guys are really special. Uh, your capabilities are beyond what we can do. And this place over here is very remote and they need your help. And so um, Red Cross typically does the uh, projection to identify where we are actually deployed and how we are used. However, uh, we do have a, uh, a team of uh, volunteers that actually watch the weather. And when we do get deployed, they provide real-time information to the drivers of the truck of where to go. So to give you an example, if you know the geography of the United States, North Carolina is one of the uh, one of the states that is on the east coast of the United States, and Louisiana is in the Gulf of Mexico. And we had a drive from North Carolina to the Gulf of Mexico. It was about a uh, a trip of a thousand miles, and now I have to do my conversion. Uh, uh, 1600 uh, kilometers and the weather team was able to tell them go this way go this way go that way to avoid the hurricane that was coming into louisiana so that they can uh, uh, drive on roads that would not be affected by the weather and so to that respect um, that is our only risk assessment group we don't actually do anything beyond saying and how many disasters will there be uh, this year? Or where is the hurricane going to hit? Because the, uh, the US's National Weather Service does a really good job of telling us uh, where all of the uh, uh, projection of the, the hurricanes will be. And um, 
our one of our recent uh, one of our recent uh, deployments, we actually assisted a medical facility in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Louisiana got hit this year by three hurricanes, uh, which <clears throat> for the size of the state of Louisiana was pretty darn amazing. Um, what the heck, the U.S. had, uh, uh, or the, <clears throat> the Atlantic Ocean this year had, and I, I lost track at about 34 different hurricanes, different named hurricanes and tropical storms this year. So um, anyhow, we, uh, we actually sat outside of a medical facility and provided them their communications needs and sometimes their electrical needs when the electrical power went out. And so, yes, um, uh, you know, we do help them, but we don't actually uh, deploy. We, we don't just hop in a truck and deploy. We actually have to be invited uh, to deploy. I hope that answered your question. There's another question I see below there. Yeah, so the, uh, this question is, uh, now what are the scopes of integrating local chip solutions in this vehicle from Bangladesh? So considering, I um, mean, uh, local solutions, cheaper solutions issues. So what do you think about that? Yeah, and so uh, this is one of the, the cheapest solutions that one could ever imagine. Uh, you can, you have uh, the storage capability. This is uh, pretty useful. We have the communications capability. And by the way, they're, uh, uh, one of the devices that comes with this is a rather large antenna that you can actually um, uh, get the, uh, or you could transmit, uh, or you can um, get a greater distance for your cellular phone uh, interface. And then you could uh, uh, transmit a lot more uh, or a lot further distance for your Wi-Fi. Uh, we have solar, and if you have your own diesel generator, uh, you now have a box that could be loaded into the back of a, uh, a vehicle, and it could even go into a relatively small vehicle if you put the seats down. Uh, some of the small uh, Tata uh, cars that I've seen running around, and uh, if you have one of these uh, boxes at, uh, at, every, um, at every India IEEE section, or for that matter, um, uh, groups of uh, volunteers all throughout India, all throughout Bangladesh, all throughout any other um, uh, country where this may be deployed. It may not be used a lot, but uh, at least it's at hand when, it, uh, when a disaster does strike. And if, if a volunteer is capable, uh, perhaps there is uh, uh, a disaster in Tamil Nadu, and you can have uh, volunteers from some of the surrounding states uh, all drive to Chennai, uh, where the disaster might be uh, might be occurring, and you could have uh, several of these boxes and several of the vehicles that drove in with these boxes uh, available. Uh, again, you know, probably the biggest problem for all that is going to be. Uh, and, and this is what I have seen, uh, the fuel to run the generators to uh, uh, generate the power that you might need for uh, a situation like this. All right. That is relatively inexpensive. Um, you know, these, these power packs alone uh, can be charged up before a disaster and uh, can be used before disaster. These are uh, made in China, as you can imagine, and they probably cost... Uh, I think we bought these for $8 US. I have to believe that you might be able to find them for cheaper because transportation costs would, would be cheaper. And um, all you need is uh, a way to uh, charge these and, and uh, keep them trickle charged during uh, before disaster. Notice they also have a, uh, a solar panel, so they can charge some, but not quite a bit. And even just having power like this, uh, this handheld uh, power bank is uh, useful for people uh, because as I mentioned, it has the light, which uh, might be useful if there is no power in your home or in the vicinity. I hope that answered your question of cheap local solution. Yes. 
uh, if you have any further comments or questions to Arafat uh, Rahman, you can type or you can ask. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, Mr. Defri Hamdana from Indonesia or, or Japan, I'm not sure. Uh, he just thank you for your insightful talk. <laughs> so, thank you so much. So, any other questions or comment, please uh, uh, unmute yourself to talk or just uh, write down. So, another question is like, I mean, uh, what are the minimum modules uh, one must consider to build a, uh, um, a mobile vehicles like this? Uh, what do you think, uh, comment on that? So that it can be uh, cheaper and uh, easier to make. So minimum number of modules uh, one need to consider for this kind of things. Well, based on your experience. Um, I, I guess uh, from the word module, would that be um, as I mentioned, uh, oops, let's go back up. Are you talking about this box being module or the components inside being module? Uh, I mean, uh, but, but box is uh, uh, considering a box is a module. Like, I mean, if I okay. say like solar, so this is uh, one module. So definitely solar needs uh, uh, other things. Uh, uh, so we, I consider that solar panel and related things are one module and so on. Uh, uh, okay. For example, yeah, please. So if you, if you look at, at this picture and, and what's included in this, um, any module that is deployed needs to um, <clears throat> generate power, at the very least generate power and, and have communications to, to be useful, all right? Now, how you generate power could be only a solar panel. Uh, it could be um, a diesel generator, it could be both. Uh, keeping in mind that if you have a solar power or if you have a solar generator, uh, if you have a solar panel, you will need some way to convert that into usable power for your communications equipment, which means you may need a storage device. And so, you know, if you talk about what is the minimum in a module, um, it would be some sort of power generation and some sort of communications generation. Now, how you deploy this and the number of these modules that you deploy really depends on the size of the disaster and the number of people you want to address. If you can find a very inexpensive way, and by the way, this, this what you see here is <clears throat> not necessarily inexpensive because this lithium UPS storage device and converter is about a $1,000. Um, <clears throat> so what is that nowadays? 65,000 rupees. Um, and the solar panel itself is about uh, uh, $400. So if you could find more inexpensive ways, you could make more of these modules. And uh, for a typical disaster that we, uh, we visit, they, they probably would use approximately 20 of these because we would have one of these at every, every shelter. If you have a more, and, and by the way, um, the U.S. is typically more sparsely uh, populated uh, in areas that you need disasters. So if you have very uh, heavily populated areas, they might need more. So these, um, these devices, uh, if you could find a way to make them cheaper, you know, the cheaper you make them, the more you could have. You do need people trained on them and how to use them, and you do need people to be able to deploy with them. So not only is it how, how do you make it inexpensive, it is how do you make sure that you can deploy it and deploy it and operate it effectively. So I hope I answered the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, uh, that's a wonderful insight as well. So uh, you can find another question uh, by, uh, from Defri uh, in the I chat box. Yeah, please. And uh, it's talking about using, uh, uh, it is a tool that you could use, permit from one country to another. Now, you know, keep in mind that uh, very often uh, countries get very nervous when you want to uh, transport technology between the countries. Uh, a good example of this is um, if I wanted to take this big, huge box from the country of the U.S. and drive it across the border into Mexico, uh, they would look at it and they would want to know what it is and what we're doing, et cetera. And that's why we're advocating that really each country needs to be 
uh, separate with their uh, design of all the contents of this box as well as their, um, their deployment itself. Because uh, power differences vary by country. Um, this has a big giant lithium battery, which means it can't fly on an airplane. Uh, it's, it's okay if you drive it by a, an automobile or for that matter, even a bunch of these in a truck and uh, drive it from one uh, location to another. But also, uh, is it easier to get gasoline or diesel in your, uh, in your area where you're deploying this? Uh, or who knows what the heck, uh, is it easier to get uh, uh, some sort of uh, generator that works on burning wood? You never know, it all depends on where you are. Or for that matter, um, oil as opposed to diesel, as opposed to gasoline. Um, perhaps there's even a better uh, a way to deploy this by having people riding stationary bikes and uh, using a generator that way. There's all sorts of different variations. In fact, if you think about it, that might even be the cheapest way for you to uh, um, have this is to uh, have a bicycle, uh, a stationary bicycle or a bicycle that has its own dynamometer or uh, generator that uh, you can use um, and having somebody pedal, you still will need a converter and a storage device. Maybe that's something that students can work on. Let me create a, uh, uh, a bicycle-like device that will uh, do conversion and store that uh, energy in a lead-acid battery, which is a lot more, uh, or which is a lot less expensive. You'll still need to uh, design the converter uh, uh, technology. But uh, there's lots of products out there in the world. Um, I have one. I don't know if you could see this. It's right behind my monitor, so I'll point it out. And if you could see, uh, this is a, a standard uninterruptible power supply um, that uh, you can get from my local uh, uh, computer store. And it allows me to... Um, to run some equipment for a certain amount of time that runs on a 12 volt battery. And so uh, if you just use that same, uh, uh, use that same electronic set and now your battery is a large automobile battery instead of a small little battery inside the, the uh, unit itself. And then you, uh, you charge it all with a, uh, with a generator that's uh, being powered by somebody pedaling a bike. That sounds like a great uh, student project that you can uh, to work on to see if that would be uh, useful. Now, you know, what's the whole goal of this is to uh, um, maybe uh, use it to charge these. Maybe use it to uh, 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 get onto your uh, data network for for a mobile phone and then provide that to, uh, to people. Um, I had, uh, when I visited um, India one of, one of the recent times, I had, um, isn't that interesting? I'm getting a phone call right now. Um, you can, um, uh, there was a device about this big that, uh, that was used to connect to the cell phone network uh, for data communications. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of relatively inexpensive ways to get the same functionality of that big vehicle, as well as this smaller modular move box um, that I uh, encourage you all to uh, investigate. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. So I have another, I mean, um, uh, questions, I mean, the point, like in slide number 12, you mentioned about the uh, IEEE volunteer uh, versus uh, rate cost or rate percent volunteer. So, I mean, uh, is there, a, is it a very easy transition to be a, a volunteer for this kind of uh, activities? I'm looking for this. So, uh, um, the way we run this in the United States, and, and this is why we need to actually uh, investigate. Uh, let's see, I think I have one more. Gosh, it was that far away. I think it was this slide you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yes. um, 
you know, and, and, and that's why we're, we're doing the international uh, project uh, with uh, IEEE is because the way each country works is different. Um, Red Cross is a non-governmental organization that does disaster relief, but in many countries, it is the um, uh, it is the government that actually is the only organization that does disaster relief. Um, in the U.S., Red Cross is uh, is non-governmental. There is an organization called Salvation Army. They also participate as well. Um, even companies. Um, have been known to uh, uh, to have their own disaster relief organization. I remember uh, Procter and Gamble has a big 18-wheeler truck that rolls up that has uh, washing machines on it uh, and dryers that uh, allow people to use their uh, equipment to do their laundry. Because if you don't have power, uh, we, every every U.S. home has a washer and a dryer, and that's unusual for, I hear from the rest of the world, dryers, um, clothes dryers, I should say. So uh, with, with respect to our IEEE uh, uh, group, so we're learning from Red Cross how to uh, interact with disaster survivors and how to um, set up equipment, uh, communications equipment and, uh, and computing equipment in Red Cross uh, offices, and and also you know what happens in a in a disaster because we, as I said, we rely IEEE volunteers rely on the Red Cross for our housing and our and our food and sanitation, and it's just one additional bit of training that we need, not necessarily on ed, uh, on technology, uh, what is a computer, what is a router, etc but how the Red Cross does their own thing. And so <clears throat> when Red Cross needs us, uh, they contact the IEEE. The IEEE reaches out to our trained uh, volunteers. And these would be volunteers who have been trained by both uh, the Red Cross as well as our MOVE equipment. And then the, uh, uh, the people who can deploy then deploy. So I guess, I, I think I took a long time to answer your question, didn't I? Uh, okay, yeah, thank you. So another, uh, it's not a question, but uh, it's a comment or thinking of uh, in a private message to me. So I'm not mentioning the name because he put it in private message of, um, in chat box. So he said that lots of rethinking has uh, uh, to go or go into a similar project in resource constrained parts of the world, uh, right? So it means that in developing countries or technologically uh, weak countries. I mean, they should have lots of resource constraint issues and so on. So the first responders are not often well equipped, coordinated, and that readily available uh, in many parts of the world. So this is his comment. I mean, what do you think about that? Like, I mean, the Western and, US versus like, I mean, India or Bangladesh will have uh, totally different infrastructure and how to deal with emergency issues and uh, and so on so please uh, give some point on that and 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 that is unfortunate uh, uh, you know in the US uh, the government uh, has uh, the capability for uh, responding to disasters but the, the the advantage that we have as well is that we have these non-governmental organizations that actually can respond to these disasters. And um, we're finding more and more and more communications is the key to uh, a good disaster recovery. The outside world does not know what has, typically what has happened. And so being able to, to send back pictures, being able to identify the needs that you have are very important. And so, you know, there's, there's two ways of going about this. You can rely on a central authority, a government or so, to uh, be the one who, who uh, does all the coordination, and hopefully uh, they're able to do that. But also, um, with communications, 
and with the capability of generating power, now you're going to see a lot more distributed um, capability that uh, technically adept people will be able to do this. Uh, a good example of this worldwide is uh, the amateur radio uh, group. Uh, the nice thing about amateur radio is that it's uh, its frequency, or I'm sorry, its uh, capability for communications does not rely on an external satellite, and it can uh, transmit really, really, really far. Its wavelength is such that um, uh, you can transmit to anybody listening. And so I think you're going to see more and more that now that there are capabilities for communications, um, you're going to see probably an improvement of uh, the responses to disasters. And unfortunately, nowadays, there are a lot more disasters going on more frequently uh, to respond to. But I, I think with the, uh, the global availability of satellite communications, low Earth or orbit, where you don't need very much equipment to be able to communicate, I think we're going to see an improvement of that. And I think we're going to see a lot more uh, non-governmental organizations uh, crop up and be available to respond. So, you know, one of the, the things that I could uh, urge you is to be a part of that. Um, start to discover in your own country, in your own area, what are the non-governmental organizations that uh, respond to disasters. I know Red Cross is international. So uh, uh, find out what your International Red Cross uh, uh, area does, and perhaps volunteer with them, uh, become uh, knowledgeable of what their their processes are, and uh, get involved that way. And then, with your experience and and knowledge of IEEE, uh, when we do make a call for involvement. Uh, you will know what the non-governmental organizations do, and you'll know what IEEE do, does, and you'll be well situated to uh, be a volunteer and help out in that way. Yeah, I mean, excellent point indeed. Uh, just uh, to add, like you mentioned in one of the earlier slides that uh, for 10 to 12 days, there were no electricity after the disaster. So, I mean, uh, many developing countries, uh, um, we have lots of disasters as well. But uh, to face the disaster, uh, it's not so strong. So many people remain depressed that, I mean, we are not strong and uh, a rich world are very strong and so on. But actually, when a big disaster is there, then, I mean, uh, people suffer. I mean, irrespective of the uh, rich or poor, I mean, many people suffer all over the world. So uh, this project is an example for us and uh, we can move further and further and further. Uh, and from this talk, I think that we, can, we got lots of ideas and courage as well. And your last points are basically very uh, instrumental that uh, we can go for low cost or customized or based on our demand and step-by-step -step process and so on. So these are the few points uh, I mm, would like to uh, add <laughs> with that. So I think that we don't want to have any Yes, please, yes, please. You will, you will be allowed to do that. Yeah, of course, please. Is uh, uh, in, in this sample deployed box, some ideas that people came up as well is um, water, water uh, uh, sanitation. I'm trying to think of uh, um, uh, being able to uh, disinfect water. And, uh, uh, you know, that is... In, in the US, uh, that may not be such a, a, a big uh, need, but in the rest of the world, it may be important that we include in this box some way of uh, uh, sanitizing water to, uh, to make, because you know, what are your, your basic needs is uh, uh, water, food, and shelter. And so um, being able to uh, have the capability in here of, uh, of uh, disinfecting water might be useful. So that, you know, that is another area that, that might be important for somewhere else in the world. Yeah, exactly, exactly, wonderful. So, I mean, uh, definitely it's a wonderful talk indeed, and uh, we are very, very grateful to you. 
so with that i would like to thank you uh, professor uh, uh, jim or james <laughs> uh, and i would like to uh, just uh, thank you all and uh, with that uh, before i conclude just uh, i share uh, one slide so that um, oh i should uh, uh, i should oh you took uh, you took it back right Oh, yes, yes. Do you want to share? No, 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 that's else? it. I'm fine. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, just to please uh, submit uh, for next year, these uh, conferences uh, uh, together will be held in Japan uh, in uh, after the Olympics, so August 2021, uh, International Conference on Informatics, Electronics, and Vision, uh, the 10th time, and the in International Conference on Imaging, Vision, and Pattern Recognition. Uh, this is the fifth time together. And if you look at the, the websites, you'll find that, I mean, who are, are running this conference and very top people and uh, in the research community. Uh, for the imaging vision and pattern recognition this year, uh, one of the general chairs uh, is uh, 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 Professor Richard. Uh, uh, I mean, he's a very big guy. His Google citation is almost 60,000. Uh, so you can understand that uh, we are trying to make this conference is very good. And the third uh, international conference on activity and behavior computing will be held in Thailand. And you can submit paper uh, to this journal, uh, uh, Computer Vision and Signal Processing. It's a free journal, free to publish and access, but the work must be, I mean, uh, relatively uh, good. I mean, not that good, but at least it should be, I mean, good and original work. So with that, uh, I, I especially thank uh, uh, James uh, for his uh, wonderful time in the early morning. Uh, and we hope that uh, uh, we can move further this kind of projects. And any of you uh, uh, today in the participant, um, uh, I mean, and also in the future on YouTube uh, uh, channel, like if anyone has any idea uh, uh, you want to incorporate or uh, engrave it, just feel free to contact uh, with us, uh, especially James, and then get some ideas. Uh, we can have more uh, discussion and brainstorming so that IEEE or engineers and others, we can uh, develop the world and make a better uh, world. With that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, you all. So, uh, James, can we wrap up or any comment? No, nope, I'm, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, see you again next time. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.